Hello and welcome back to Guitar Lessons from Spain. Today I'm here with David Collette, president of Guitar Salon International. Welcome. Thanks for having me. Beautiful city, beautiful room. Nice to be in the heart of Andalusia where the birth of the guitar happened. Yeah. Well, um, let's talk a bit about your knowledge mm -hmm. about uh, what makes you an expert and why you are the president okay. of Guitar Salon. Well, when I was at university uh, doing my studies <clears throat> back in the late 80s, early 90s, um, I had the good fortune to study with the Romero family, Celine Romero in particular, and um, he did all the conventional teaching, you know, technique and working on repertoire in your pieces, but he also taught me about the guitar, the history of it, because he has a very large collection of old guitars and knows the history of the guitar intimately and grew up in Spain and knew all the guitar makers. So he shared that with me. So I got a little bit of a bonus education with him um, and he showed me instruments and I would occasionally take a guitar home, like an old guitar or something. And so I got sort of a hands-on experience and he told me all the old stories of Santos Hernandez and of Miguel Rodriguez. And you know, I, I was very interested in, in the guitar making history, thanks to him. And that was sort of my introduction. And um, Tim McClouchy, who actually started GSI and owns GSI, um, was also a student of Romero's 15 years or so before me. Oh, he went, I, we, we, I didn't we, know that. Yeah, we went to the same university. And so he got the same sort of education also when he was a student of the Romero's. He learned all about the guitar makers and that helped him a lot when he started GSI, obviously because he had a sort of a head start. He knew a lot about the guitar makers. So I got a little bit of that education too. And so Salim was the one even who recommended that when I get out of college, I should contact Tim McClouchy and join up with him. So when I started working with, with, with Tim, obviously, you know, GSI is kind of the hub of all the great classical guitars that are ever available in the world come through GSI at one point in time, right? So just by virtue of being there and having a hands-on experience, uh, I've been there now over 20 years. And so I've seen, you know, name it, I mean, so many guitars. It's just anybody who's there gets to do this. Uh, the, the guitars just pour in. And so that's where the education comes from. Also, I'm, I've developed a lot of good friendships with guitar makers, collectors, historians, um, people who write books about the guitar. So I've, I get to interact with a lot of experts um, in the history of the guitar, the, who the makers were. Uh, also knowing people like the Romeros, they're a, an incredible resource for knowledge and information uh, about the history of the guitar. And um, it's just been a really rich experience being at GSI and that's, that's how I've learned what, I've, what, I, what I know. Just, just by virtue of being there. Well, also, Pepe has over 200 guitars, doesn't he own like I don't one? even know if he knows how many. It's a lot, yeah. <laughs> so it's, 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 there's a lot of guitars. The Romero's collectively, as a, as a, as a family, it's, it's, and it's always changing. There's guitars kind of going out, and there's new guitars coming in. It's always mixed up. It's, 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 so I don't know if they really know that what the count is, but it's, it's a lot of guitars, oh. yeah. Well, what makes GSI different than other guitar dealers? Oh wow, what makes us different? I think, uh, well, we do a lot of volume. We get a lot of instruments coming in, probably more than anywhere else. And um, we actively promote them. We do, well, even if people are trying to buy guitars from us, we won't let them out our door until we fully documented them. We do amazing photography. We've got a photographer, Felix Salazar, who does the most amazing photographs. Everybody in the world just admires our photos. And when we, when we show the guitar off, we try to show sort of two styles of photos. We show to the sort of the, you know, the front, the back, you know, the, the headstock, the side of the guitar, kind of the, 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 we call them like the product shots. Mm -hmm. But then we like to do the artistic shots. So we have the prose and we have the poetry. The artistic shots where he gets to really go in and do kind of beautiful angles and kind of lighting and really to show off little elements of the guitars that are particularly special about that guitar. If there's sort of interesting wood patterns or grains or inlay work or whatever, he really zooms in and gets you these kind of close-ups. So we, we like to document the guitars really nicely. We try to do videos on almost every guitar. Uh, sometimes it's not possible, but we try to get videos so that people can hear audio samples and see what it looks like to see the guitar actively sitting on somebody's lap. We put that out there. We also write pretty exhaustive descriptions. We try to be very detailed and very accurate to describe exactly what the guitar is. So when, when you go to our website and you look at a guitar, mm -hmm. you're getting a lot of information. And the goal is, is uh, from the point of view of somebody who would be interested in buying it, that they get 90 to 95% of all the information they're gonna need about the instrument just by looking at our page. The other 5% they fill in by trying it out and actually you know, having it on their lap. But that's, I think, what, what makes us different from other dealers, I think, is that we really go the extra mile. 
to really describe the guitars uh, in, in, in great detail, show them with the photographs and in, 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 in the videos, to really profile them so that the world out there, you can be anywhere in the world and you, you have a very good idea of what each of these guitars is. How close to the sound of the actual guitar do you guys zero in on with? Because I mean, you, you must yeah. have like amazing sound guys too. Yeah. Uh, Felix Salazar, our photographer, also does, is our videographer. No way. <laughs> yeah, and his whole, his whole philosophy with the audio that we do is he wants to get the microphones positioned in such a way that he's really capturing the actual sound of the guitar. So that when it's reproduced, and he doesn't use any compression, he doesn't add any reverb, he doesn't do any EQ, there's no processing. Wow. So the, the, what you're hearing is what the guitar actually sounds like in the room, and he does a very good job. And um, part of the thing is, is that uh, we have to represent the guitars as honestly as possible. You don't want to record a guitar um, and then add all these special effects to it to make it sound bigger and better than it actually is. Because then you ship it to the guy to try out. He's going to be disappointed. So you want to actually represent the guitar as accurately as possible so that you're, you're getting as close as the, the goal is to get the sound and the audio and the video as close to the actual guitar as possible so that people have an expectation of what, 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 the, the, what it actually is. And a lot of times we send the guitars out to people and they say, wow, it's actually as I was, it's actually even a little better, but it's, 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 it's <laughs> as I was hoping, meaning everything, all the information that was on your site was accurate. It, it, I, I made the right decision to have you send this one out. Yeah, yeah that's that, the goal. That, that is amazing. Yeah, yeah. Um, what are the benefits of buying a guitar from a dealer mm -hmm. or specifically GSI over going directly with a luthier? Uh, well, if you go with a luthier, it's a one-shot deal. You know, you're kind of throwing all your eggs into one basket in a way. And a lot of people do that. If you really are super informed and you know exactly what you want, working with a luthier is, is a great experience. Um, but if you're sort of, you don't have sort of detailed knowledge of all, all the variety of instruments that are out there, uh, we provide sort of the educational uh, experience of, of acquiring a guitar. And also we have options. We have trade options, you know, people, buy a guitar with us. Some people want to own two or three guitars total at a time, but they may not want the same two or three guitars all the time over the long term. So they can trade guitars in and out and we can walk you through the process of finding a guitar. We're sort of matchmakers. So when somebody calls in and they say, yeah, um, I'm not sure what I want, but um, we start asking questions. Well, do you have a favorite guitarist? Let's start there. Yeah, I really like so-and-so on his recordings. Okay, well, he plays a cedar top and he plays blah, blah, blah. And we can start narrowing down and drilling down. That's the experience that GSI provides, mm -hmm. is to help people walk to, from a, a jungle of you know, hundreds of possibilities or thousands of possibilities, let's say, because there's a lot of guitars in the world. How do we narrow it down to find the right guitar for that person, for whatever their needs are at that time? That's what we do. That's the, the experience that GSI provides. You have a trial period too, yeah. don't you? Talk, yep. talk about the trial period. The trial period, so basically we would never want anybody to buy a guitar blind because then they may regret it, you know? So we, we let them try it first, basically. Yeah. And so people anywhere in the world, we can ship a guitar out. And we have a, it's, it's a 48-hour approval policy, but, you know, sometimes people need an extra day or two or whatever. But that way the, the, the person gets the chance to hear the guitar in their home, compare it to other instruments they might have, show it to their teacher, take it into a venue where they might be performing to hear how it projects or, uh, you know, to demonstrate it. So it really gives them, and they don't have a sales guy breathing down their neck, you know, the whole time. They can do it in the privacy of their own time. And uh, a lot of people, we even have clients in Los Angeles where we're located who prefer, rather than coming in, they would rather us just have an Uber driver drive it over to their, to their place and keep it for a few days rather than come in. Because when they come into our place, it's an overwhelming experience. They, a lot of people want to try too many guitars. That's, that's a problem. And then you get kind of confused. Your head gets kind of, kind of clouded up. It's like having too many glasses of wine, you know? <laughs> <laughs> after six or seven glasses of wine, you're not tasting the wine anymore, you know? And after seven or eight guitars, the same thing. You start getting a little muddy-headed. So, and also, you know, our room has a, little, a nice ambient sort of uh, sound, a little bit of reverb in there. We do concerts. That's where we film all the videos. So people come in and they play all these guitars and they've got this ambient sound. But then if they take them home and they're sitting in their home and it's a drier sound, it's a different perception. So it's a better experience for people to do it at home. Um, because then they're in a controlled environment that they know. They know the acoustics of their rooms and they really can evaluate the guitar a little better, I think. And they have more time. And they can so compare that's the it to group. other guitars that they might right, already own. Right, exactly. Yeah, exactly. That's, that's, that's another benefit is that they, they can, and like I said, show them to their teacher, show them to their friends, uh, test it out. They can record on it, see how it records. What does it sound like when they do that? Change the strings if they don't like the strings. You know, it gives them an option. It gives them several days to kind of absorb the guitar and really evaluate it. 
I actually know somebody who I went to school with. Um, I, I don't. I guess I won't mention their name. Mm-hmm. But they they went to a uh, dealer, and they they brought in their sound equipment to record, and uh-huh. they didn't let him record. He wanted to record the sound and compare it later. Uh-huh. And the 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 owner was like, no 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 no. I don't want any recording equipment. I don't want you to record the guitars because it might, you know, show the guitars in a different light. Yeah. So that that's really good that you know we don't have a problem with that. If somebody wanted to record yeah. themselves, I mean, people are doing it now with iPhones and things. They come in and sure they'll they'll have their friend or their wife or whatever uh, kind of record them on different guitars, and then they go home and think about it, and then they think, okay, you know what? I think I know which one I want to try out or whatever. So we have no problem with that. That's awesome. Yeah. Um, let's talk about Tone Woods because uh-huh. um, I know that several people online don't know uh, about the differences in sound. I know that you know. We've talked about this forever, but mm-hmm. <laughs> uh, full disclosure: I've known David since 2007. So, mm-hmm. and I've bought two guitars from Guitar Salon, and I'm 100% satisfied. And I'm not being paid to, to, <laughs> for, for for this interview, so I just want to make that very clear. I'm not getting. I might buy you a coffee afterwards. Okay. Yeah. Good. yeah all right. Good. All right. Okay. <laughs> but okay, uh, Tone Woods, mm-hmm. uh, sp- someone who doesn't know anything about guitar. Let's talk about spruce versus cedar. Okay, yeah, I mean, um, sound boards are traditionally made with spruce. Mm-hmm. Um, other words have been used in the past, like pine, for example. Torres even used pine. Um, but it's, it's, it's rare. But spruce has kind of been the main uh, wood that's been used traditionally. Uh, and then in the mid-1960s, uh, cedar was popularized. Mostly, it, it started really with Jose Ramirez in the mid-60s. The earliest cedar guitar we now know was built in Italy that we know of in the early 50s. Wow. Uh, yeah. There, we have an article on our website about this, but that's a whole other can of worms. Yeah, I won't get okay. into that. But in, ni- but in the mid-1960s, Jose Ramirez was really the one that pioneered the, the kind of the, the mainstream use of it. And it caught on like wildfire. Um, by 1967, uh, only the first Ramirez is appear in 64, 65 with cedar. Mm-hmm. And by 1967, you see Miguel Rodriguez is using it. Um, by 1969, I've seen Fleta using it. Um, Hauser II was even making cedar guitars in the late 60s. The so, Romero's have one. Yeah, 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 yeah. 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 It's the, the, they've, they've all had, I believe, cedar guitars from Hauser from the late 60s. And so cedar became a very popular wood. One of the reasons it was so attractive early on was because players felt that the impression that it gave them was that you didn't have to break it in over a long period of time. The guitar sounded kind of played in already when it was new. That was sort of a benefit. You kind of got, we now know that there's actually a different flavor of sound that it brings too. So um, spruce and cedar are basically, it's like chocolate and vanilla, you know? Do you like uh, some, I have at home personally, I have eight guitars. Uh, Four of them are spruce and four of them are cedar. So I like them equally for different reasons. So it depends on the repertoire you're playing. Spruce tends to be a brighter, this is a generalization because there are spruces that don't do this, but spruce tends to be kind of a brighter sound, a clearer sound, the overtone content is more controlled, it's a little more focused, there's better separation between the notes. Mm -hmm. Cedar tends to be warmer, kind of a heavier overtone content, it's a little bit of a looser style of sound. The notes tend to bleed into each other a little bit more, so there's less separation. So if you're playing, so players who play, I don't know, Brazilian jazz or bossa nova music, whatever, tend to favor cedar tops because it's a warmer, kind of fatter sound. Mm. And spruce is cleaner, crisper. It's, if you're playing Baroque music, it's kind of a favorite for counterpoint because you can really get the notes separated out. But having said that, there are bright sounding cedars and there are warm sounding spruces. So there's a little bit of overlap. But in general, those are the, what those woods tend to do. They tend to want to do naturally. And so, and, but a lot of it also has to do with the finessing of the wood by the guitar maker. Because good guitar makers who really know what they're doing can take a piece of spruce or take a piece of cedar and really finesse it in certain ways to get, to get it to sound what, like what they're trying to get it to sound like. Mm-hmm. So that's why it's important to realize too that when you blindfold it, for example, I can, if you put a bunch of guitars in my hand, I can tell if there's a Fleta, I can tell if there's a Rodriguez. I, can, I, I know what the sound of those makers is because those makers left their own sound in it. So it's not so much the wood as what the guitar maker does with it. But guitar makers will choose the different woods because they may want to attempt to achieve sort of a different sound and spruce may be 
the better wood for that for that guitar or for that customer, whatever they're building, and cedar might be better for this one over here. And so guitar makers use these woods as options, sort of like a, a cook uses different spices and ingredients as options. You know, yeah. What about uh, for the backs and sides? Because there's 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 rosewood, which can come in like at least three varieties of uh, Brazilian, yeah. Indian, and Madagascar. Uh -huh. Do you notice a difference between those? Less so than with the tops. Tops, you, you have a bigger difference in the, in the, in the tonal qualities when you're, when you're talking about soundboards. Back and sides are sort of these structural elements that you, know, you need to have a box, you need to have an enclosure. So uh, I've talked to steel string players who claim to, tell, to be able to tell the difference between Indian rosewood and CSA rosewood is what we call it. Um, and in the, in the classical guitar world, I have had a real hard time being able to tell much of a difference. I can hear a difference with cypress mm -hmm. or maple a little bit, but they're a little bit more like, they just kind of color the sound a little bit differently. With maple, I hear sort of, I call it a golden glow. Mm -hmm. You know, if you have rosewood, rosewood is kind of a hardwood. It's more reflective. And so you kind of, the sound that comes out of the box is a little bit more direct. Whereas with cypress, cypress tends to vibrate a little bit more. Um, uh, this is why flamenco players like it so much, is because it's really the whole guitar rattles and vibrates, and um, so you get kind of a, a bigger attack and less sustain. Maybe um, again, it depends on the thicknesses and everything. I'm, I'm, I'm generalizing, but uh, I think for the back and sides, a lot of it has to do with the aesthetic. I think people like the way the guitars look a certain way, and guitar makers choose these woods based on how it's going to look. But for sound, it's not as critical as uh, the tops. The tops are really where it's all at for sound. I talked about this with John, John Weissenreiter, uh -huh, uh -huh. and uh, he said that he th he felt that Brazilian was a little bit sweeter. Uh -huh. But I I, I was I, I, I kind of have my doubts about right. the actual. I mean, everybody could, everybody has an opinion on it, you know. Yeah. And guitar makers definitely have an opinion. And I I've, I remember once I was visiting um, Jeffrey Elliott up in Portland, and he pulled out some wood for me. He pulled out some Indian rosewood and he pulled out some Brazilian rosewood and there were little pieces of it and he was kind of tapping them. They were thin little pieces and you could tell the Indian was a little bit thuddy mm -hmm. and the Brazilian, it had a little bit more like, it kind of had a ting, almost like crystal. But he admitted too that he says that the thickness is that a guitar is built uh, when, once a, a guitar is finished, but the back and sides. He says, I'm not sure if I can really tell the difference between Indian and Brazilian. When a guitar is actually made, but if you if you cut them into small little pieces and you and you actually test them, you can hear little differences. Well, I think it'd be interesting if you shared the uh, Torres uh, paper mache back and side story. Yeah. That, that well, I haven't that. seen that guitar, so I don't know it personally. But, uh, but there's it's, 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 it's been recorded on. I think the story was is that Tare, uh, Torres, I think, was uh, um, interested in seeing what would happen. Yeah, if you use really poor materials for the back and sides, but built a nice top. And I think the conclusion of that experiment was that uh, the guitar sounds great. If you've got a good soundboard and you've got a good top, um, then you're going to have a good sounding guitar. Um, and the, and the, the body of the guitar is important in the sense that it has, you have to have a box, you have to have a structure. Mm -hmm. uh, but the materials that you're using are a little bit less important than the top. And I think that there has been, in guitar making history, there's been sort of a debate that's gone back and forth over the millennia or centuries, let's say. Uh, you know, how important is a back? And people, there are guitar makers still today that put a lot of research and emphasis and design and, uh, into, into the backs. And so it's still talked about even today, but I think in Torres' time, I think Torres wanted to see what would happen if you just built a really nice top and put the cheapest materials you can find uh, that are for sound purposes, absolutely terrible. And the guitar, from what I'm told, I, I don't know the guitar, but it's supposed to be a fantastic guitar. And Stefano Grandona has actually recorded on it. You can hear recordings on it. And it sounds great in the recording, so yeah, I think that's sort of what was behind the whole thing. Interesting. Yeah. Uh, what about French polish versus lacquer? Can you describe them both and tell us about how to, does it affect the sound quality? Yeah. Or. Yep. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. French polish and, and lacquer. Um, French polish is the traditional way of varnishing an instrument. Uh, violins. It's, you know, it goes way back. Um, slightly different, uh, you know, formulas have changed over the years, and even today, guitar makers uh, will do different uh, recipes, sort of, for what goes in. Some people are purists, and they'll just take a little bit of shellac and, and alcohol and apply it to the guitar. Some people like to add other things, that you can add benzoin and sandarac and mastic and all kinds of things for color or for strength or for the way it stretches and the way it ages. So um, everybody has sort of a different take on it, but the, the, the basic French 
and, and what French polishing is, is the technique of applying it with a muñeca, with a cloth. Uh, the word French polish is not referring to the material. The material is shellac. Ah. Yeah. So if you're actually, so when you're talking about what, what the stuff is, it's shellac or shellac based. And it's applied using the French polishing technique because there's also English polishing and it gets all complicated. But, uh, but uh, that is the, it's, it's, it's a difficult process to do. It takes a, some training and some level of expertise in order to do it. So it's not very easy to do. Um, and it also takes a long time. Some people spend more time polishing the guitar uh, than they do actually constructing it. So polishing is, it's a big can of worms. Uh, lacquer, on the other hand, is a modern thing. It's a synthetic, you can spray it on. It's, it goes on really quick. It's very fast, it's very convenient, um, particularly when you're talking about production guitars where you're mass producing guitars. It's the quickest and easiest way to do it. Um, it is a little bit more, it's, uh, to me, the sound of it, it's a little more restrictive. It does kind of, it's a little bit heavier if it's applied thick. There are some makers who apply uh, uh, lacquer very thin and you can actually get a very good sound. But, um, I mean, I think the idea is the best sounding guitars have no finish on them at all. Oh, wow. And there's stories about even um, Torres. He owned uh, La Leona. His whole, he built it early in his career and kept it his whole life. It was his personal guitar and he never finished it. It didn't have any finish on it. He liked the sound of it. So the reason you varnish an instrument is to protect it, to protect the wood. So the cells of the wood you want to protect from oil from your fingers and dirt and dust and things getting in it and it can, it can damage the wood so you want to protect it. So that's why it's done. And I think shellac is a very natural uh, finish to put on a guitar and so the guitar responds nicely to it and uh, it's a very comfortable, it's a very good relationship to have shellac on, 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 on the wood uh, and the guitar tends to vibrate naturally, uh, much closer to an unfinished guitar and lacquer is a little bit more restrictive. It's like having a rubber coat on, on the guitar, sort of, that's the analogy I think of. So, or like a wetsuit, it, 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 it holds the guitar back a little bit. But again, this is all, there are some really high level professional guitar makers who can do both and who choose to do lacquer sometimes. And if it's done thin, it can, it can have very, very good results on the sound. So, but anyway, I'm, again, I'm generalizing. Yeah. What about bracing patterns? Can you touch no. <laughs> up, yeah. up a little on bracing patterns? Like uh, the five, uh, the five fans versus the seven. Uh -huh. Does it affect the sound? Tell us. Yeah, yeah. I mean, bracing is, is you have to have braces in a guitar. It's, it's, it, it, braces do several things. They uh, add reinforcements uh, to, the, to the top so that you can, uh, so that it doesn't collapse. You know, you need, you need uh, if, if you built super thick tops, you wouldn't need any bracing. But then the guitar would sound like a table. <laughs> and you don't want that. So you want the, you, it, it's a matter of uh, the thicknessing of the top to get it to vibrate properly, to get good sound. And then the braces are put in there really to hold it up. And also, uh, when you're doming the top, which is very important because that adds stiffness. You can go a little bit thinner and you can, you can, you can dome the top to add stiffness to it. The braces are put in there also to hold the doming position in place. Hmm. So the braces serve a lot of purposes. The number of braces, uh, how they're arranged, that is a matter of taste uh, from one guitar maker to the next. Um, and you know, there's a lot of obsession over how you brace a guitar and this kind of thing, and there's a lot of debate. But I think um, I, there's a really fun story that Pepe Romero told me that I think is worth telling here. Go for it. And um, that talks about bracing. And um, it was an experience he had back in the late, I think in the late 60s, early 70s. Um, they were playing Rodriguez guitars. And Rodriguez's are big guitars. Um, they're thin tops. Uh, they're very lightly braced, they only have five fans usually, um, uh, long scale, deep boxes, lots of doming, uh, and at this time they were playing, all the, the, Rodriguez was making a lot of cedar tops, he tended to favor cedar. Mm -hmm. So they went to Herman Hauser II, and, who was building a very different kind of guitar. Thick tops, very little doming, uh, seven fans instead of five, bridge patch underneath with locating pins, the whole thing. So there's a kind of a contraption for the bridge. Um, shallow box, smaller scale. Um, and they went to this, to Hauser and said, try to build a Rodriguez and do it just like Rodriguez. And so Hauser accepted the challenge and he built basically, uh, and Pepe said it was actually pretty amazing when they first saw the, the first finished guitar. They pulled it out and they looked and the doming was like a Rodriguez, the size of it, the length, uh, it was cedar. 
the thickness of the top was just like a Rodriguez. They looked inside. It was <laughs> internally. It was like it was. It was like a Rodriguez. It was a Rodriguez. It just built by Hauser. They played it. Sounded like a Hauser. <laughs> and so the lesson learned was that when you look at bracing and you you talk about the thicknesses of the tops and this kind of thing, it's a little bit of a superficial view. You're looking at a bird's eye view. You're kind of just it's it's a structure. But what a guitar really is at the end of the day is millions of tiny little decisions that the guitar maker meant, did when he was building the guitar. He's in there testing the stiffnesses and he's feeling that the wood, he's sanding a little bit here and you know, making little adjustments. And by the time you accumulate a gazillion of those little tiny decisions, and a lot of these guitar makers aren't even thinking about it necessarily. They're just, it's a feel thing to them. They're kind of finessing the guitar and, and little adjustments here and there. By the time that's all done, that's what the guitar sounds like. And Herman Hauser had a sound that he just, he built guitars that had a sound. And so you could build, you could ask him to build something with doming like this or five fans or whatever, and he would do it. But at the end of the day, it's gonna come out sounding like a Hauser because that was the touch that he left in the guitar. And so it was a kind of a failed experiment in a way, you know, <laughs> but it was an interesting one. And what that, te what that tells you is that, yeah, you have to, guitar makers have to choose a structure. And so they have to have a bracing pattern to work with, but it's more, once they've got the structure in place, it's more the detailing that they do that matters and determines the outcome of the guitar and what it's going to sound like. Rather than, you don't just build a seven fan guitar and it's going to automatically be a great sounding guitar. That's not the case at all. There's a lot more that goes into it. So anyway, that's my take on bracing. Yeah. Excellent. Thank yeah. you. Uh -huh. uh, what are some common myths about uh, guitars that you would like to dispel? Common myths about guitars that I like to dispel? That old guitars Yes. get played out and uh, guitars, I've heard some people say guitars only last 25 or 50 years at the most and then they get played out, which is absolutely not true. Guitars, if they're well taken care of, and I think they're, the reason this myth exists is because uh, the older a guitar is, the more likely it's been damaged and maybe badly repaired. Yeah, and those guitars don't sound that great. So if, if that's what people their experiences uh, of old guitars is playing, you know, badly repaired, damaged guitars, then I can understand they have this idea that there's this myth that old guitars sound bad or something. But if a guitar is taken care of and it's played respectfully and uh, uh, it's, it's, we don't know how long guitars last. The oldest traditional, in, in our style of guitars, the oldest guitars, let's say if you go back to Torres, are 150, 160, 170 years old or so, and they sound fantastic. So. Guitars seem to age beautifully if they're played well and, and taken care of, and they have to be played um, regularly. Otherwise, you know, the worst case is, you know, sometimes if I go down to South America or if I'm in Spain, a lot of times people pull out a guitar from under the bed and they, oh, this was grandpa's old guitar, but it hasn't had strings on it for 30 years. You know, those are the guitars that will, they need a lot of work to bring them back and revive them. But the guitars that sound great are the ones that have been played continuously wow. over the, ever since they were built. Yeah. Um, you sell a lot of um, a lot of copies of the masterpieces of guitar making. Like mm -hmm. uh, you sell copies of Romanios by Christoph Sebner, mm -hmm. Stefano Wachetti, Boucher copies by mm -hmm. John Bisonreader, and, mm -hmm. and also like um, going further back to copies of Enrique Garcia and Simplicio by Luigi Locato. Mm -hmm. um, what would you say to someone who says, because uh, I've, actually, I've, actually, I've actually heard this many times uh, from people that say, oh, replicas are for collectors. They are not for players. Mm. What would you say to somebody like that? I would say I disagree. <laughs> uh, I mean, the, uh, the whole concept of a replica is, you know, the history of guitar making, there have been some masterpieces that have, really, that have been built that are in the history books. Mm -hmm. And people are in awe of these. Um, they can be highly um, uh, decorated guitars with a lot of inlay. And that's one thing that people can be inspired by. Or maybe there's a guitar that had a famous sound, you know, Segovia's 37 Hauser, for example. Everybody's, you know, that had a famous sound and Segovia talked about the sound of it. Or you talk about certain Torres guitars. So guitar makers can become obsessed with these iconic instruments that have appeared in history, you know? And there's a kind of a curiosity to try it, you know, to go in and try to get your head in there. And um, some guitar makers, um, 
well, I'll give you an example. Kenneth Broger, for example, who's guy who has built a replica of a Torres, he actually bought a Torres. He owned one for a while, and he didn't build his replica of it right away. It was so, he had the guitar for several years, and he studied it, and he lived with it, and he played it, and he got his head into it. And he had professional players come by and play it for him, and he really evaluated it. He measured it. He you know he really got to know this guitar inside and out, and then he attempted to see if he could reverse engineer it, and he was curious to see if he could do it. And he built a guitar that was, um, you know, it didn't sound exactly like the original, but he learned a lot from the process, and he, he, he kind of refined his sound a little bit in the process of trying to understand this Torres and trying to learn how to build such a guitar. Um, and it was a very educational experience, and I think it's uh, uh, provided him enormous insight that he can now build it to his regular models, not, not his replicas, but it, it, it was a kind of a learning experience. And so I think that's, uh, um, but I, I, replicas, modern guitar builders who build replicas don't build them to go to collectors. They build them to be played. Mm -hmm. I mean, their, their goal is to make them playable for a modern concert player. And this idea of replica too, there are very few makers who actually try to do exact replicas. A lot of guys are just basing their model, let's say, on a Simplicio or a Torres or a Garcia or whatever. Um, there are some guys who, try to, who really try to make a carbon copy of it, but a lot of guys, for example, we just had a Gabriele Lodi guitar came in uh, from Italy, and um, he's very careful to make sure that the world doesn't think he's trying to build exact replicas. So what he puts on his label uh, for his model, he calls it My Torres Interpretation. <laughs> nice. So, and what he does, uh, as he tells me, is he says, look, what I've done, I've seen so many Torres's and I've restored so many Torres's and I love Torres, that when I build my Torres model, let's call it, it's more sort of a, I'm taking bits and pieces from all the Torres's that I've seen, elements that I like from this one, elements that I like from that one, and I'm doing it in my own way, I'm spinning it in my own way. But it's a fully modern guitar, it's meant for a modern player, it's meant to be played, you know, you can record concerts, you can, you can, you can use it in the studio. It's meant for uh, a modern player in today's world. Concert player, professional, professional player. It's designed for that guy. Even though it might look like an old guitar and I put a lot of work into the way it looks and it looks like a Torres and I do all the inlay work like a Torres or something. But he says in the end, I'm, I'm building a modern guitar and it's my guitar. And it's just influenced by some of the great guitars I've seen. So I think that's more, more common with these guys that are making these kinds of not quite, not quite replicas, but sort of they're, they're, they're building guitars based on something that's come before. I was thinking, um, to tell us the story about uh, the whole John Williams, like wanting to buy a Smallman to sound like John Williams. <laughs> <laughs> you, you told me that story a long time yeah. ago. Yeah, no, it was, it was, it was funny. Um, gosh, this was a long time ago, maybe... <laughs> It was right around the time when I started at GSI. I'd only been there for maybe a year or two. So this was in 2000, 2001, 2002, somewhere in there. Uh, yeah, I had a lady call in and she said, uh, I'd like to sell my Smallman. I just got it very recently. Uh, I waited on his waiting list for 10 years and I'd like to sell it. And I thought, that's a little strange. Don't you wanna, I mean, you waited so long. Don't you wanna enjoy it? And, and, and I mean, you, you must have wanted this guitar. So why did you, why do you wanna sell it? And she said, oh, because uh, I don't sound like John Williams. <laughs> and I had to explain to her that it wasn't the guitar's fault, you know? Because uh, people have this idea that um, if you get a guitar that so-and-so plays, you're going to sound like so-and-so, right? And that's not how it works. <laughs> if you want to sound like so-and-so, you've got to be able to play like so-and-so. And, -so. and um, the great players, I think, uh, in history, when you talk about whether it's Pepe Romero or Andres Segovia, or Julian Bream, uh, these guys all had a sound. In fact, a lot of people told me that, I, I never got to see Segovia, but one of the compelling reasons why people wanted to go see Segovia was to hear his sound. He had this very, very unique sound, the way he played the guitar. Mm -hmm. And um, it's so unique and so refined that it's not copyable. There have been copycats that have come along and tried to sound like Segovia or try to sound like Bream, and you just can't do it. Um, and so, uh, but a lot of people think that if you just play the guitar that they're playing, that'll help you. And that's not the case. So, um, because when you hear a great player playing, it's a combination of, yeah, the guitar is contributing, but it's also the way they play. And it's a kind of a combined thing. Actually, um, 
Pepe Romero has been a really important teacher to all of us at GSI. And uh, another really great thing that he's pointed out to me is that when you hear a great performance, yeah. whether it's a recording or you go to a concert or whatever, it's a three-way collaboration. Hmm. And there are three contributors to that experience. One is the player. Hmm. And he brings along his set of skills and talents and artistic insight. And he spent his whole life, a, a good concert player, like somebody like Pepe Romero, he's been playing since he was a kid. His earliest memories of being alive are having a guitar on his lap. And he honed his skills at a very early age and he brings his expertise as a player to the table. That's contributor number one. Contributor number two is the composer. And a good composer is gonna be somebody who has equally spent his life refining his techniques and his talents. And a well-written piece of music played by a great player is we're two thirds of the way there. The other third, the other component is the guitar maker, the instrument builder, uh, who's contributing to this collaborative uh, effect that leads to you to these, to these great performances. A well-built guitar by a guitar maker who brings all of his skills and his skill set to the table uh, and builds a, a majestic instrument. In the hands of a great player, playing a well-written piece of music, these are the moments that we live for, to experience, you know, and we aspire to be also. But it's, it's a three-way collaboration. And uh, this whole business about, oh, if I just played uh, a guitar that so-and-so plays, I'm going to sound like so-and-so, it's not quite that easy. It's, it's the player, it's the instrument, mm -hmm. it's true, but it's only a third. It's also the piece of music you're playing. And that combined uh, effort is what results in the stuff that inspires us. Yeah, anyway. Definitely. Yeah. Um, another thing regarding small mints, an interesting thing. Um, I've noticed, like, personally from listening, because I've have thousands of CDs. <laughs> John Williams sounds like John Williams on the Smallman. Mm -hmm. And then everybody else who has bought Smallmans to because of John Williams, because mm -hmm. everybody seems to go towards the uh, Matthias Dahman route or the Smallman mm -hmm. route because of David Russell and John Williams. But all the other players of Smallman tend to sound like each other yeah. than actually yeah, well, John, John, John Williams is a very, very, um, I mean, I've seen him play many times, yeah. and he has a very strong technique. His right hand is, is, is quite powerful, mm -hmm. and he really digs in and draws out. So he, when you hear John Williams playing, yeah, he's, you're hearing a lot of John Williams. His personality is so strong um, when he plays any instrument. Um, another funny story I have is that I was in London a few years ago, and um, I went into the London Guitar Studio, and the guy that runs the place there is an old friend of mine whose name is Juan Tahira. And he told me, he said, oh, something really interesting just happened. And I said, what was that? He said, John Williams was having some problems with his guitar. It was in the repair shop or whatever. And he had a couple of recitals uh, at, the South, the, at the, um, uh, the South Bank. Um, it's um, the Waterloo, at Waterloo in London. There's a, uh, it's Queen Elizabeth Hall. Uh, he had two recitals there, uh, two nights back to back, and he was without a guitar basically. And so he came in and he needed to borrow a guitar. And so I was going to loan him one of our expensive guitars, but he said he didn't want to be responsible for anything too expensive. So he borrowed a cheap kind of student guitar, like a factory guitar, <laughs> like an $800 guitar. Yeah. And, um, and he played the two concerts on it. And I said, well, what happened? He said he dazzled the audience. <laughs> because he sounded like John Williams. Yeah. He sounded like himself. The audience didn't even really notice so much. Uh, I think he played or with the orchestra one night and then he played a solo recital the next night. And his, his, his sound, the way John Williams sounds, and it's, this is true of Pepe Romero. Mm -hmm. This is true of Julian Bream. The great players have a sound. And the instrument that they're playing flavors the sound a little bit, but you're still hearing their sound. It's them primarily that you're, that you're hearing. And the guitar is contributing a little bit. But um, I think when you have players that are a little bit, let's say, mm, they, have, they haven't really quite found their sound yet, um, students that are learning and this kind of thing, then you'll, you'll hear a lot more of the guitar. And the, the balance is a little bit heavier on, you know, with, with the sound of the guitar. But uh, whereas when you have these really, really strong players with really a, a strong technique, you're hearing the player, and then the guitar kind of flavors the sound. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So Pepe does sound different when he's playing different guitars. John Williams sounds different when he's playing different guitars. But you can still identify the player in either case. How much percentage do you think is the actual player versus the guitar? Oh, I don't know if it's measurable. But yeah. <laughs> but you know when you're hearing somebody that you know how the, what they sound like and how they play, you know who it is. I mean, I can turn on the radio 
And if uh, I turn on the classical uh, station and there's uh, somebody playing, I, a lot of times I can recognize who it is. And I always wait. It's funny, Tim and I were at lunch one day. Uh, we're driving back from, from lunch and we turned on the radio and there was the Giuliani concerto was on, um, on our local classical music station. Mm -hmm. And um, we listened to it for a little bit. We listened, we listened. And I said, I think I know who this is. And he said, who do you think it is? And I said, it's Eduardo Fernandez. He said, you sure? I said, I'm pretty sure that's, that's his sound. He has a very specific, kind of a specific sound, especially his thumb sound. Uh, it's very naily. And um, so we waited, we parked, at the car, parked the car back at GSI and the piece wasn't over yet. So we sat there for 10 minutes waiting for it to end. And then it ended and then the, the guy came on at the end and said, and that was Eduardo Fernandez playing the Giuliani Opus 30. Yeah, so you can if you can identify a player, yeah. um, the, the, the great guitar players, they, there's, they bring a lot of their own personality into the playing that's identifiable. And the guitars they play kind of support that. And I think the importance of, of the guitar to the player is that when a player feels really comfortable on a guitar and he really likes the guitar and the guitar is doing things musically that he is trying to do, it helps him achieve his goal and it assists him in, in his aims musically, he's gonna deliver a better performance and he's gonna be able to artistically have the freedom to move in the directions he wants to musically. And um, I think that's the relationship of a guitar to the, to the player. Yeah. Final question. Sure. You sell guitars that range from at least 2,000 to 30,000 plus. What's the difference? Uh, what's the difference between a $2,000 guitar or even a 10,000 up to a $30,000 guitar? Well, in general, um, you know, the, the, the cheaper the guitar, typically you're gonna find guitars that are kind of mass produced. Um, factory guitars. Uh, you do have some concert guitars that are production type guitars. Jose Ramirez workshop has, it was even like that back in the 60s. They had 30 makers at one time. Very important, good makers, but they were making the same template of guitar. And so uh, even for a concert guitar, those are considerably low priced. You can get a, Rose, a Ramirez concert guitar for anywhere from five to $15,000. You don't have to you know, spend 30, 40, $50,000 to get a Ramirez. Um, but the, the higher end guitars become, it, it, it's sort of a matter of supply and demand also. So certain guitar makers who have been around for a long time and have a, a reputation and are played by important concert players, let's say, and they might only build eight to 10 guitars a year, let's say, and they have a 15 year waiting list or whatever it is, you know, those guys, their prices are gonna be higher. It's just a matter of supply and demand. It's just, just a, it's a matter of uh, the market value finding itself. Um, and then, of course, when you find the historical guitars, those are the ones also that can be, you know, these, these big values. And it's because of the scarcity and the rarity of them. And um, uh, they're part of history. People buy all kinds of things that are historical. I mean, look at violins, for example. Um, people pay a lot of money, a lot more money for violins than even guitars. So guitars are a bargain by comparison, even <laughs> historical guitars. Um, but uh, you find this across the board, people who buy fine art. I mean, I, I follow Christie's auctions a little bit once in a while, and it, it's amazing to me how people will spend $10 million, $20 million on paintings or artwork, or, I mean, there was even a, <laughs> a few years ago, I remember there was an Andy Warhol uh, called Eight Elvises, which is basically Elvis Presley. It's this silver Elvis with a gun, you know, kind of in a cowboy outfit. Uh, there's like eight of these prints by Andy Warhol, and some guy paid $100 million for that. So it's a matter of scarcity, fame of the whatever it is and we have a little bit of that in the guitar world you know if you have an old guitar that was well we recently had such a guitar we had uh, a Torres that was owned by Tarega and Tarega only owned three so they don't come around very often you know that's a very rare guitar um, and it has a lot of history in it um, and so people will value that guitar very highly um, and uh, a lot of times people are willing to pay big bucks to keep those things out of museums, you know? <laughs> <laughs> so there's a little bit of that. So yeah, there's a whole range of values and it's related to sort of supply and demand, um, the reputation of the luthier, um, if there's any historical uh, significance in the instrument, there's a wide variety. There's probably 30, 40, 50 variables that go into ter determining the value of any one guitar. How it's built, the materials it's made of, when it was built, who built it, uh, and any history associated with it, basically. Yeah, there's, it's a, it's a complicated algorithm, yeah. Is there anything else that you would like to share with our viewers? Um, I think you've asked all the questions. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs>
All right, well, thank yeah. you so much. And if you're interested in trying out a guitar or learning more about guitar, go to guitarsalon.com. Thank, thank you, Miguel. Thank you. Yeah.